Hello and welcome to the Big Data Training for Cancer Research special seminar. I'd like to take a moment to again thank John Fry of the Purdue Center for Cancer Research for all the work that he's put in, into ensuring this workshop and the associated meetings and seminars run smoothly. Um, so as per usual, I'd like to make a few notes on um, some housekeeping items. So please, for this talk, um, make sure your view stays set to speaker view on Zoom. Uh, John has set it for you, but if you want to double check that uh, your Zoom is on speaker view, you can hover over the right corner of your Zoom screen um, and click on view and make sure uh, that the check, mark is, the check mark is next to speaker. I'd also like to remind you that we will, as per usual, keep your microphones off for the duration of this seminar. And please feel free to use the Q&A function or the chat at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. You can upvote questions you like, and these will float to the top and have a greater likelihood of being answered. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. James L. Moeller. Dr. Moeller is a professor of computer graphics technology. He is currently serving as Associate Dean of the Graduate School in Research Integrity, as the Graduate School in Research Integrity Officer. Dr. Muller is a faculty scholar, a member of the Purdue University Teaching Academy, and a past faculty fellow for the Discovery Learning Center. Dr. Muller is a member of Purdue's advanced team and has served as a diversity catalyst. Dr. Muller has authored, co-authored, or contributed to over 21 texts related to computer graphics and media development and over 71 articles for refereed, reviewed, or trade publications. He's been the recipient of $1.5 million in grants. Today, his talk will focus on two prevalent challenges for scientists, reproducibility of their work, as well as data management tactics and requirements. Thank you so much for taking time to be here with us today. And now I'll hand it off to you, Dr. Muller. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you for uh, inviting me to come and, and do this talk. Um, so what I'm gonna do today, uh, as far as the way I'm going to logistically share my screen, rather than do the typical Zoom share screen, I'm going to actually do a composite screen that looks like this. And so if you uh, change your view to, um, uh, to speaker view, it should blow up this uh, image so that it's a little bit easier for you to see. Um, so uh, the two main topics that I'm here to talk about are uh, reproducibility, reproducibility, excuse me, and data management. But before I get into that, um, I will say, you know, as a research integrity officer, I'm kind of duty bound to talk a little bit about this. So if you'll uh, forgive me for just a, a quick preamble, um, you know, the goal of any research integrity officer at any institution, you know, one of the consistencies is that our, our job is to kind of protect the research record. And as you can imagine, anytime research misconduct occurs, um, because we all build upon the work of others, uh, really is kind of like pulling on a thread in a tapestry, the entire thing unwinds and it becomes very difficult. So, um, you know, on behalf of uh, Rios everywhere, your institution, wherever you may be, I want to take just a minute and just acknowledge that uh, nearly every university has at least a person who's either designated specifically as Rio or it might be some other compliance officer, but I would encourage you to make sure that you're familiar with whatever the research misconduct policy is at your, uh, at your institution, as well as the appropriate way to report, uh, you know, things that that appear to be research misconduct. I will say that research misconduct, it really, uh, the federal policy is bound by three specific things. That is fabrication, creating fake data, falsification, taking data and making it say something it doesn't, or otherwise things like p-hacking, data dredging, those kinds of things. And then lastly, plagiarism, uh, basically literary theft or idea theft. And there's some context wrapped around this, but I would encourage you to know that, you know, these are the three things that are bound in research misconduct policy, at least at the federal level. Now, it doesn't cover everything that could be an integrity issue. Um, and that's one of the things that's challenging. I've been serving as research integrity officer about two years now. Um, and there are a lot of things that come across my desk that may not fit into the research misconduct bucket, but they are still are integrity issues. Um, and so that's one of the things that can be somewhat frustrating for researchers, for uh, compliance folk, for people that do this kind of work, is that not everything falls under that bucket. And so here's a, long, here's a list of things that typically don't. Authorship disputes are probably one of the biggest things that uh, uh, 
people would expect to find uh, in a research misconduct bu bucket, but don't necessarily, they are and can be integrity issues. And when I talk about authorship issues or disputes, it's usually situations where one person publishes without including another person or including people that may not really uh, deserve the credit of authorship, those kinds of things. Um, and there's a long list here that uh, of other things, uh, which, and, and the, the very last category called detrimental research pra uh, practices are probably uh, one of the biggest areas uh, that has gotten attention by the NASM and, and uh, other groups. So uh, I would just encourage you as a kind of a preamble to this talk, um, just make sure you know the policies and procedures of your institution. Uh, typically, you're going to report to a, a research integrity officer or a RIO or some other kind of compliance officer, and it varies per institution. Um, I know working with RIO colleagues across the nation, um, some of them wear multiple hats and different hats and those kinds of things. So uh, just be familiar. And lastly, when if you're going to spend a li any time at all in research, you're going to probably observe something that looks like research misconduct. Um, now, what I will say is, at least in my experience, let's say hypothetically, if I if I had 20 allegations that came forward in a year, let's say half of those probably would not move. But they basically the people would be exonerated. It, there would be some others. It would be something other than research misconduct. And so confidentiality is key. And so if you observe something that you believe is research misconduct, first and foremost, follow your process and uh, make sure you keep it confidential. And so that uh, individuals truly do get due process. So with that little preamble, I, I apologize for taking liberties today, but I've, I, I'm kind of duty bound to any talk I do as research integrity officer with these kinds of topics. I try to, to touch on that just a, a little bit. So uh, to the topics we, you actually came to hear about today. So first of all, I want to talk about reproducibility. Um, and this is a challenge, I think, for all of us uh, as researchers, no matter what research area we're in. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, that can support or or inhibit, I guess you could say, uh, uh, reproducibility would be kind of either not adhering to these normative structures of science, which go all the way back, you know, to 1942, Merton and his principles. And I apologize if you just heard my dogs barking, um, our little alarm systems going off. Um, but as it relates to the normative structure of science, there's basically four things that kind of help us relative to reproducibility. Um, uh, universalism, this idea of evalu evaluating the research, evaluating research on its own merit, as opposed to kind of giving stake or claim to research simply because of who does it. Um, in other words, because they have a reputation or whatever. Um, this idea of communalism, that is open sharing. Uh, as opposed to secrecy and trying to keep things closed. Um, disinterestedness, excuse me, disinterestedness, I can't get it out, but the motivation uh, that, you know, we're all motivated here to expand our disciplines, to expand science, to expand uh, the knowledge base uh, that we're all, uh, you know, going for. Um, versus self-interest, that is, you know, trying to be competitive and uh, which really kind of, uh, goes against why we're uh, all involved, I think, in science and, and discovery. And then lastly, just this what, uh, and it's kind of a, a peculiar term, I think, is or organized skepticism, um, basically considering all evidence, not just your own work, um, where it's not just your particular view, your particular, as, as it says here, dogmatism uh, relative to your particular topic. So to me, these are the things, and I mean, again, it's got a, this has got a long history and there's a tremendous number of publications that refer to uh, this normative structure. And there was actually, just for accuracy, I mean, there were, in 1942, there were actually two different documents that Merton put together. There was a shorter one that was basically, I think, the democratization of science. I think that stands out in my mind as far as the name. Uh, then the more popularized or the more probably more uh, uh, one that's referred to more is this thing called the normative structure of science. But uh, nevertheless, these things are key, I think, to uh, the concept of reproducibility. Um, and when we become particular, when we become secretive, when we can become self-interested or we become uh, focused on our own particular perspective and dogmatic about that perspective, that's when it can inhibit reproducibility and the trustworthiness of what we do. So that's one piece, I think, as a kind of a backstory to talking about reproducibility. 
The second thing that I would talk about is no matter what kind of research we do, and I come from, uh, you, you are all cancer researchers and doing much, probably much more important work than I did as a researcher doing computer graphics research with visual and special effects. Um, but nevertheless, regardless of what field we're in and what kind of uh, work we do, there is this core of shared research values that we have as a community, regardless of which community we belong to. So this idea of being accurate um, reporting finally, findings precisely and, and being careful to avoid errors uh, as real. A lot of times, you know, I think, I think um, uh, researchers becoming successful uh, can oftentimes lead to finding, trying to find shortcuts and those shortcuts end up creating errors. And those errors, when they become acceptable, lead to detrimental research practices and potentially research misconduct. I mean, it's, that's how folks find themselves in research misconduct. Um, it's, it's usually a small steps in a cumulative way that lead to a person to commit fabrication, falsification, plagiarism. So accuracy and taking the time, and, I, and, it, and it's, I say that tongue in cheek because I know we're all under pressures to produce grants, to produce results, to produce uh, publications, to make an impact in our discipline, but all of those things have to be held in uh, constant to being accurate and avoiding errors. Second would be efficiency, being efficient with the resources that we have and using them wisely, avoiding waste as much as is possible. Being objective and letting the facts speak for themselves. And I go on, I, I would go on to say be, being careful to avoid improper bias or extrapolation. I think we all want to try to push the envelope and, and you know, but there's a balance point to where we can push too far, too hard, too fast. Um, that can lead us to make uh, biased, Bias, bias conclusions that don't really inform the public uh, as well as they should. Trustworthiness, uh, following through on commitments, being reliable, that uh, trustworthiness, both with uh, you know, the, the, the subjects that we may work, work with, whether those be full, fully human subjects or whether biological samples or whatever it is, uh, animal subjects, but being trustworthy and being good stewards of those things and not taking it, not taking for granted the ability to do, to, to do the research that we're able to do. And then lastly, uh, integrity, having being honest and having strong moral principles publicly and privately. Um, to me, these are kind of the things that these are, I, I, these are squishy terms that are difficult to measure, but we know when we see them and we know when we don't. Um, we also, the other thing that I would say is when one sacrifices these things, whether in a real way or a perceived way, it, it, it harms the entire research community, not just individual researchers. Um, so given the context of these two things, um, what I want to do, and I typically, the, the, there's, a gra there's a research course that I teach called um, uh, Responsible Conduct Research at Purdue, and I oftentimes, I keep coming back to this clip, even though it's somewhat dated, and what I typically like to do is to try to um, have everyone listen to it because I think it's a good, a good balanced report. But I also want to, it, it addresses or touches on several things that I think are critical relative to um, replication and the challenges that exist there. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I mean, I can only have my microphone on or the audio from my computer. So I'm going to go silent here for a few minutes. And I simply want you to listen to this clip. And if you've got a notepad or a pad of paper or whatever is next to you, I'd encourage you to jot down some things that stand out to you. And then after we've listened to it, I'm going to, I, I want to touch on a few things and I'm going to follow up with what I think are some of the challenges with replication. So uh, give me a second just to get this set up and, and, and switched over. And I think it will work uh, just fine. Kate, it is often as you'd think. David Green spoke with NPR. come up with fascinating results, but the results cannot be replicated as often as you'd think. David Green spoke with NPR Shankar Vedantam. So here's the deal. Researchers recently tried to replicate 100 experiments in psychology that were published in three leading journals, and Shankar's here to talk about that. Shankar, what did they find? They found something very disappointing, David. Nearly two-thirds of the experiments did not replicate, meaning that scientists repeated these studies 
but could not obtain the results that were found by the original research team. Two thirds of these original studies, which presumably at least some of them drew some attention, actually turned out to be false when this replication was tried. Yeah, so calling them false is one explanation, David. In fact, there have been some really big scandals recently where researchers have been found to have fabricated the evidence and data. So that's you know one possibility. But I was speaking with Brian Nozick. He's a psychologist at the University of Virginia. He organized this massive new replication effort he offered a more nuanced way to think about the findings. Our best methodologies to try to figure out truth mostly reveal to us that figuring out truth is really hard and we're gonna get contradictions. One year we're gonna learn that coffee is good for us. The next year we're gonna learn that it's bad for us. The next year we're gonna learn we don't know. When you fail to reproduce a result, David, you know the first thing we think about is that, okay, this means the first study was wrong, but there are other explanations. It could be the second study was wrong. It could be that they're both wrong. Nozick said it's also possible that both studies are actually right. To use his example, maybe coffee has effects only under certain conditions. When you meet those conditions, you see an effect. When you don't meet those conditions, you don't see an effect. So Nozick says when we can not reproduce a study, it's a sign of uncertainty, not a sign of untrustworthiness. It's a signal there's something going on that we don't understand. Well, Shankar, how do scientists respond when their work is checked and, and in some cases disproven? You know, they respond defensively, David, and perhaps that's not surprising. Nozick told me that one of his own studies was tested for replication and the replication didn't work. I asked him how he felt about his earlier work being shot down. We are invested in our findings because they feel like personal possessions, right? I discovered that. I'm proud of it. I have some motivation to even feel like I should defend it. But of course, all of those things are not the scientific ideal. There isn't really an easy way uh, to not feel bad about those things because we're human and these are the contributions that we as individual scientists make. You know, Shankar, if this is a healthy process for scientists to be constantly checking one another, I mean, one problem I see is that doesn't happen that often because most scientists want to sort of be doing original research and not spending a career looking at other research and trying to see if it was right or not. I think that's exactly right, David. That's one of the big goals that Nozick is focusing on with this new initiative. Research journals also have a big incentive to publish new findings, not necessarily to publish reproductions of earlier findings. Many science organizations are trying to figure out ways to change the incentives so that both researchers and science journals publish more reproductions of earlier work, including results that are mixed or confusing. Okay, I mean, this is all well and good if, if we're to understand that, that each time a new study comes out, maybe we should view it as sort of an ongoing search for the truth. But does that mean that when we see a big headline about some study, we should just ignore it? Well, this is the problem, David. I think many of us look to science to provide us with answers and certainty when science really is in the business of producing questions and producing more uncertainty. You know, as I was listening to Nozick talk about science, David, I realized there are parallels between the practice of science and the practice of what we do as journalists. You know, we paint a picture of the world every day, whether that's a war zone or financial markets, but we're always doing it in the context of imperfect information. And especially when we're covering things we don't know much about, you know, a big breaking story, what we discover in the first few days is likely to get revised down the road. Now you can throw up your hands and say, let's not waste time reading or listening to the first draft of history. Let me just wait a month or a year for the whole picture to emerge. But I think most people would say the best information is still valuable, even if it's going to get updated tomorrow. We need to think about scientific studies the same way. Shankar, thanks as always. Thank you, David. Okay. So what I'd like to do is, and I, I guess I didn't give Nadia or uh, John, I didn't give either one of you the heads up that I was going to try to do this, but typically when I use this in the class, I try to get feedback from the participants. So I'm not sure if they have the ability to either whether the chat or in the Q&A to what, but what I'd like to pose the question is what did you hear, what, what stands out to you in that clip relative to reproducibility? What are, what are salient important points that were brought out into that? And I have just a little bit of a discussion before I just continue to talk. So whether you want to use the chat or I don't know if we can use the microphone feature or not. John, can we unmute mics? If... Uh, yeah, if people want to raise their hand if they want to answer, I can unmute their mic. Okay, okay here, here's uh, some people are putting things in the chat. Okay. Okay, so I think uh, so. Christine mentions this very first point. So, um, and it is one. And and if you saw me, I, every time I listen to that clip, I basically write down, and I usually have my students do the exact same thing. And it's amazing to me the you know uh, every time I hear it, I hear something different. But 
I will say, yes, I wish there was this, this idea of the incentives is kind of the word that they use, but basically the idea that the incentives and the organization, the things that we get rewarded for as, as researchers don't, re don't reward us for reproductions, that is to, to you know, try to replicate a study. And, and certainly I'd even go further, we certainly don't see anything where we publish errors or things that don't work a lot of times. And I, I question how often, uh, how often uh, we reinvent the wheel rather than sharing the failed results or having a mechanism to do so. So Christine, great point on the very first one. Um, uh, Non-reproducibility is not always fabrication. Uh, so that's a great point. Um, that uh, just because something doesn't replicate, there's lots of reasons why. And I think we as researchers, I think, understand that, but I don't know that the general public understands that. And that's one of the things I think this clip kind of talks about is that oftentimes people think that, uh, well, you, you, just because the one study is wrong, another study is wrong, uh, or, you know, they talk in here about, you know, today coffee's good, tomorrow coffee's bad. It could be that both studies are right. It just depends, and I think we as researchers understand that, but I think we have a we also have a duty to make sure that the general public understands that as well. That just reproducibility doesn't always mean fabrication, and also doesn't mean untrustworthiness, right? And I think that's an important point that was brought out in there. Um, so we do need to create, re and, and this always comes up in the class that I teach, is that uh, in, there has to be incentives, and basically the, the the incentive model right now does does not foster this and. And the question is, okay, well, how do we change that? Well, it's going to, because it's part of the culture in which we as researchers participate in, obviously it's going to be slow to change, but if it's going to change, it's going to be us that changes it. Um, you know, and at some point I would hope we'd get to a tipping point where it would uh, shift much more easily. Um, so, and, and uh, Roy makes a very good point here. Um, that one practice is that we can we can do to create a separation between us and our results so that our results don't become our babies and we become defensive of them is talk about the hypothesis. In other words, don't use possessive, possessive pronouns about our research. It's the research rather than our research. It's the hypothesis rather than our hypothesis. It's the results rather than our results. As, as, as small of a step as that might sound, it creates separation between us, at least to some degree. Um, and I do think it has an effect when we do that. Um, so research evolves and is progressive uh, as we do more experiments and helping people understand that I think is a, a, good, a good point. Um, so I'm just looking through all these comments, I'm catching up. You, you're, you guys are moving faster than me. Uh, so non-reproducibility is not reported. Um, two thirds of the original research. Were, so first of all, this usually comes up in my classes. People are surprised when this comes up and there's one of two reactions. They're either surprised that two thirds didn't replicate or they give me the response of, oh, well, there was, they, were, they were studies in psychology. What do you expect? You know, that's soft science. Now, let me say that I'm saying that tongue in cheek because my PhD dissertation research was in cognitive psychology. So I would argue that there is no soft and hard science, right? Um, but nevertheless, uh, uh, it, it's, I think this is a problem that ensues no matter what kind of research. I've talked to people in technical fields, right? Like computer science and engineering and those kinds of things. There's just as much challenge with repl replicability there as there is uh, on a human side or on a biological side, or it, there, this is not limited to one particular field or one particular, but I say that, uh, I, I always always say it tongue in cheek because usually somebody, so because a lot of the groups I work with are um, what I would call bench scientists or like biological, like what the research would call basic science or basic research as opposed to use inspired research as opposed to applied research. And I always like to draw some attention to that. So well, it looks like the comments have slowed down. So hopefully, thank you for indulging me for a minute, but I think it cr creates a little bit of context rather than me just talking and also engages you a little bit. Um, so let me go back to this view. So I, I, pulled, um, I pulled from uh, a report called Rep Reproducibility and Replicability in Science. So this is actually from the National, uh, National Academy's Press. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's relatively recent. Um, but it was basically a working group that was put together to, to basically deal with this issue of reproducibility, repli replicability, and give some suggestions to us as researchers as, as, as to how we can make sure that we communicate properly 
um, and we can start to address this. So they define reproducibility as obtaining consistent results using the same data and the same code, if you will, as the original study. So this would be synonymous with computational reproducibility, but I think it, it, it's not just computational, it's reproducibility in any study. Um, and there were some prior articles, some prior discussions, some prior things as it relates to research ethics and reproducibility and all this kind of whatever body of literature you want to call this, uh, where they tried to separate like computational reproducibility is different. I, this, the, I'm glad that Danesum actually came and put just set it all together. Um, so replic replicability, on the other hand, is obtaining consistent results across studies aimed at answering the same research questions. So it's like, one is, you know, reproducibility is more like a rep, like, like I would say, doing the exact same study uh, with the exact same data. Replicability is answering the same questions, maybe in a different way or with different data or with new data, right? Um, and that's kind of how they're creating the separate separation between reproducibility and repl replicability. Um, and I went in through the, uh, the definition of generalizability in there because they they came up with a specific definition. I threw it in there for good measure. Now, um, what I would say that the NASM draws out are the issues relative to this, relative to how we communicate our research results, how we, how we report. First of all is the issue of uncertainty. The reason I wanted to go back and listen to that video or that audio clip uh, recording from the NPR is because we have to, we, our, one of the jobs we have, I think, is to communicate that uncertainty does not mean untrustworthiness. And I think in the, in the public's mind too often, they believe that uncertainty means untrustworthy. And we have to help them understand that disconnect. And we have to disconnect those two things somehow. Because um, it, as it said in the clip, more often than not, they want certainty and answers, and we know as scientists what we generate are more questions and uncertainty, oftentimes. I mean, it just one study leads to another. We may, we may learn some small part, but it's not this, oh, well, I can say without a shadow of a doubt that this is true kind of thing, because um, we never prove anything. All we do is build a case, right? Now, we have to be careful with that and kind of understand that uncertainty and help others understand that. Second would be understand, uh, clearly communicating the limitations of what it is that we are doing. Um, and sometimes the problem is, is I'm, I'm not sure if, if, because we're so entrenched in it, we, may, we take certain things for granted that are limitations that someone unfamiliar with the research would say, well, that's a limitation. We don't even think about it because we're so entrenched in it. So it takes actually getting us to step back from our research, I think, to be able to accurately recognize limitations because uh, we just kind of take certain things for granted and we, we just kind of, there's a fundamental understanding that this is going to limit the results and we're looking through those glasses, but the public don't have the benefit of our glasses or our perspective. Um, confounding factors um, are uh, one of the key issues brought out. And I don't care whether you're talking about medi mediating, moderating, intervening, and there's all kinds of confounding variables that we classify and define. Anything that would... Um, Go back, uh, going back to the audio clip, would cause us to find that coffee is good today and bad tomorrow. And these contextual things and helping people understand how those can, can flavor or affect a study. And then lastly, clarity and completeness is a recommendation of making sure that, we're, that we provide as much. And this is where I think uh, being in a digital age is beneficial for us is because oftentimes in, in days gone by, we would have been limited by page, page count as to how much detail we can put in there. Uh, and even if there are restrictions, even in a digital world of how many words can be in a particular article, you can always do supplementary material and provide, you know, more than enough uh, completeness as it relates to methodology and those kinds of things on the backside. So the NASM does actually provide some, and I picked out like five that I thought were the most important uh, because they, get, they give a long list of recommendations. Some are related to journal editors. Some are related to institutions. I tried to pick out the ones that were really related to us as researchers on the ground. If you happen to be in a journal editor or whatever, you may really want to take a look at this because it gives a lot of recommendations for institutions and you know, uh, publication editors and people that grant reviewers and those kinds of things. I just tried to pick out the ones that would be specific to research. But um, as it relates to research that we write, making sure that we convey clear, specific, and complete information about any, and I would say any methods and data products, but they, they interject the word computational there, but I would say any of the methods, right? Uh, providing accurate and, and appropriate characterization of relevant uncertainties. And I think this is one of the things that oftentimes is missing in discussion sections 
of articles because a lot of times we get to the end and we're ready to quit. We've written enough on this and we want to move on to whatever's next, as opposed to taking the time to specifically outline uncertainties as it relates to, you know, the discussions, the future work section of whatever it is that we're working on, including clear, specific, and complete descriptions of how the report result was reached, making sure that everything is declared, even if there were small changes in protocol, unexpected things that happened, reporting absolutely the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, that, that happened in the research. Uh, I work a lot with graduate students and oftentimes when something goes awry, it's like, well, do I really need to address that? And it's like, hell yeah, you need to address that. You need to make sure people know that because it's an important part of the context of this. You can't just ignore the unsightly parts that you would want to ignore. You have to put the whole thing in there. Um, and this is on academic institutions, but I, you could just say institutions as a whole. We need to make sure that we're providing training in the proper use of statistical analysis and inference, uh, proper use of those tools. Um, and then lastly, avoiding over, and this is, this is on us as re researchers, we have to avoid overstating the implications of our research and also exercise caution with how we communicate that because uh, just knowing that you know, the, the results section, if we, if we extrapolate too far, it can be particularly damaging, uh, uh, particularly damaging when it gets into the public, let's say it generates a press release, or you know maybe we're not cautious about the words that are used in a press release. Um, I mean, it's kind of like this balance. Yes, we want to make an impact. We want to make our research. Uh, we want to shine a light on our research, but we have to be careful that we don't glamorize or go too far in that as well. Uh, there's a balance in between those two things, and I think that's that's pretty much to me that is the. If I were to, my one takeaway from reading that Nason report is, you know, it really is, um, it's about balance. It's about not, not overreaching as it relates to the research that we do. So that's kind of the first part of this on reproducibility. Um, I didn't see any additional questions come in. Let me just pause and I'm going to uh, wet my whistle and see if anybody has any questions, see if anything pops up there. If not, we'll move on. Going once, going twice, and that's okay. So let's jump into data, data recording and management. <clears throat> um, so I think, and I'll just pull up this, the, the, I always throw this passage up um, when I'm talking with students, but I think the reality is most of us passively learn data management and, rec and record keeping techniques. When I usually, when I teach a, a, a graduate course, let's say I have 50 students in a graduate course, and I ask, okay, how many, and these are researchers from all different kinds of areas. Most of them are bench, what I would call bench researchers um, using physical samples and research. It could be cancer research. It could be bio, biology. It could be chemistry. Uh, it's basically the science, a lot of the sciences that are non-computational, although I do get some comp folks in there. Um, some engineers, some technology, but it's mostly, but I, I have them raise their hand. How many of you have actually been trained in data, you know, uh, uh, record keeping, data record management, those kinds of things, maybe one out of 50. More than likely, they probably picked it up. And this is, I think, this is just kind of indicative of our institutions. A lot of times we're thrown in the deep end and you either sink or swim and you, you try to pick up little tips and tricks and techniques as you move along. You don't get formal training. So the most training I think that happens is if you have the opportunity to move from one research lab to another research lab to another research lab, the tips and tricks you know are probably you pick up two or three or four or five from each of those. And if you're lucky because you have that range of experience, now you have something to say about data record keeping and management. And this is kind of at, at Purdue, I've talked about creating like a seminar course and trying to pick, you know, five researchers from each of our colleges which, to fill out a semester and have them each come in and talk about what are the top three to five things you do relative to data record keeping and management that you could share that are probably the most aha things that you do relative to those. And to me, that would be like an interesting lecture, but as you can imagine, trying to get all the most successful researchers in the university to come and do that, there are, there are the ones that are burning the candle at both ends anyway, so it's very difficult. It's still something on my radar, but it just goes without saying, I think that's how we all learn is the more the more varied experiences we have in different research labs or with different types of projects, I think that's where we pick up these different. And so what I've tried to do is conglomerate some of the things that I'm aware of. And, I, and, and for some of these, I have to give credit where credit is due. Um, I don't know that uh, 
the, at Purdue, we had a researcher, his name is Peter Dunn. He was a pretty, he's one of these pillar of institutional people, had a tremendous impact on research at Purdue. And he was a Rio before that was ever called a Rio. It was before it was ever an official title. So some of this comes from him. And so um, I'm drawing upon his experiences as much as my own. So I do want to give credit where credit is due. Um, so we talk about, first, I want to talk about characteristics of research data. And um, a lot of the work that I have done in the past is really in this intangible data type category where it's, where it's numbers, where it's values, where it's, uh, you know, digital images, audio, those kinds of things. Um, I realize I'm speaking to a lot of, uh, I don't know, a lot, if not all cancer researchers. So uh, you probably used to dealing with physical materials in whatever state they might be. Uh, they may have to have different types of storage uh, requirements on them, whether it be a deep freeze, whether it be a refrigeration or whatever. Um, but nevertheless, these are these types of data, you know, one of the challenges I think is having a system of tracking and connecting them all, particularly when you get into transforming one type of data to another, like, or if you're, you know, let's, let's say, or, or even if you're tracking the data associated with it, like going from dry, dry, dry weight to wet weight to, to whatever, right? Um, having a way to track that. Um, and oftentimes we don't, I don't think that we're, I don't think we're, trained to have different ways to do this. And it could be something as simple as, um, and now uh, granted, I have a slight office supply addiction and that's a whole different talk, but it does feed into my, the, the approach that I take for data, data record keeping and management kinds of things. Um, so, you know, something very simple that, you know, I don't know, I didn't think about it until, I don't remember where in my career it kind of came up, but you know, uh, using even different colored inks, using different colored pencils, to 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 denote different types of data or those kinds of things using something that is simple as that. Now, uh, quite honestly, I, I had an admin that I've worked with for about 15 years. She did not help that office supply addiction, and that's kind of where this idea of you know whatever helps you manage and keep track of data is a, and and that you like or at least you don't loathe will probably stick and it'll be beneficial for you. Um, so, yeah. so that's types. We also have different types of uh, different states. And that's kind of like, that's where I usually want to talk about different colored inks and those kinds of, that's where, you know, being able to, when you're tracking data in a data book or, or methods book or whatever, um, being able to determine preliminary versus intermediate versus final, me particularly measured versus calculated, because nothing's more embarrassing than to get those two things mixed up. And if you don't have some mechanism for identifying that, it can really one, it could be perceived as research misconduct, unfortunately, but two, it could just be simple error. Either way, neither is good. Um, and then also published and unpublished. So we also have data transformations we have at, at the end there. So um, so what I typically do when I talk about this, um, so here are some standards for some data books, but before I cover that, um, I'm going to jump back here and I just and I did not I did not stage this for this presentation. I swear to God, these lay here all the time because I use them all the time. But having some record keeping mechanism that works for you. I mean, and I prefer these hardbound books and I don't know what your standards might be in your particular lab, but bound books I think are, are critical for data record keeping. Now, I'll, uh, obviously because I'm uh, in administrivia all the time doing research, real, real work and associate dean work, most of these books have to do with meetings and meeting notes and those kinds of things. But this translates over from when I was a research faculty member doing research. Basically, I had one of these hardbound books for each project that I was doing. Sometimes, depending on the project, I might have a data book and a methods book. And then on top of that, I usually had an overarching book that was all my faculty crap. You know, the stuff that really doesn't generate research results or generate money. It's the committee work. It's the department work. It's the grind stuff that we have to do as service work as faculty. Um, but the key is, is figuring out what works for you. Um, and there's, there's over the years, I've adopted certain techniques that I use, like one of the most critical ones that I do is in these data books is making sure that any meeting I'm in, if there's an action item, I denote it with an AI. If it's my action, I put a star next to it. If I don't put a star to it next to it, it's somebody else's action. And I usually write that person's name down. And I can't tell you how many times that has been a godsend because I, we've all been in meetings at some point where we're all sitting in the meeting. Uh, and everybody knows that Kevin is, and hopefully there's no Kevin on here. If, you're, if your name is Kevin, I apologize. Everybody knows Kevin's supposed to do something and you walk out of the room and invariably Kevin doesn't even know he's supposed to do it. Everybody else knows it, but Kevin doesn't know it. 
right? Um, and so writing action items helps a lot. I'm amazed by the number of people that I see come into meetings with nothing to write on. They don't take a scrap of note and think that they're gonna remember all the crap and it just doesn't work. Um, so that's one thing that I will say, you know, I am an OCD type A, uh, uh, you know, uh, anally retentive individual who lives his life by lists. Um, and so record keeping is easy for me. Uh, if you're more of a creative type, a big picture thinker, maybe record keeping is not your thing. Um, and what I would suggest is, you know, find somebody who's like, you know, the two, those two personalities work really well together. Um, it's the why and the how person. If you read after a guy named Simon Sinek, he has a book called uh, Start With Why. Um, but nevertheless, you know, uh, why and how, how people go well together. So anyway, those, so those are some of my recommendations. I have more books than, I, I won't show you all the books that I have, but that basically, but I pulled up the two. Basically, this is Rio, Research Integrity, and this is basically my associate dean hat, right? And so I basically have these series of books that I use. Um, and I always keep them at arm's length. Now, that's not to say that I don't use digital tools. Um, I religiously schedule everything. I religiously use email. So it's, I'm not implying that necessarily. Um, but nevertheless, uh, those are some things. Um, and uh, while on the topic, I will say, you know, um, and a person put uh, to all the panelists, if, you have, if you're not watching chat, notice that it says NI has recently introduced guidelines for data management. She likely improved the audible trail for data. So you may want to definitely look into that. And what I'm presenting here, I've kind of cobbled together from uh, sources that would probably cover NSF and NIH to some degree. Um, so let's jump to the specifics here. Let me go back to this view. Um, so as I said, having a bound book is critical and sequentially numbering the pages or at least using dates to number those. I mean, not tearing out pages. I mean, when I work with young graduate students, I'm amazed by the number of times they don't get the idea that if you have tear sheets and you just kind of stick them in spiral bound books, that doesn't work. It needs to be a bound book that's sequentially numbered as, as it relates to data and methods, particularly if you're talking about when it comes time to, you know, uh, to file for a patent, you have to have that in, in that order. If you, uh, you know, so it's, it's good for discovery. It's good for also exoneration. If you happen to be under a research misconduct allegation and you need to be able to show notes. So having a bound book, sequentially number, either sequentially date, having complete descriptions of activities. Um, this is critical and this is, I, I come from a coding or programming background. And so, you know, a common joke is everybody plans to plans to document their code, but it's usually the last thing. And if you've ever inherited code that is programming code from anyone, uh, you'll probably uh, uh, recognize what I mean by putting documentation as code is usually the last thing that happens. And so it's very thin. Similarly, complete description of an activity in your research books is a critical because it comes again for whether it be patent for just for discovery for whatever. Um, recording directly in a data book, I think that goes without saying, never white out or black out an error, use a strike through with a date, like and date it when you find an error. Um, I've talked a little bit about some, everybody has a different perspective on this, but whether you have data and methods of the same book or if you have them as separate books, um, but uh, nevertheless, and also cross-referencing, which is the next note uh, in, in here is keeping tan tangible data, data separately, but having some kind of mechanism to keep track of the cross-referencing. Witnessing pages um, is important for intellectual property rights. Um, and so if you come across a discovery or come across something, having somebody witness it and date it at the same time. Um, electronic data can be a challenge. I, I know for me, from Purdue, from coming from Purdue, the biggest challenge we have with electronic data, um, uh, security is one, I mean, because of issues of undue foreign influence and other kinds of things. But also just the, the fact that Purdue, um, you can there can be a freedom of uh, freedom of information request uh, at any time on anything, and that's one of the other reasons I like these bound books is because they are treated as personal diaries, not as discoverable FOIA request kinds of things. Um, but you want to be familiar with whatever the whatever your institution's uh, guidelines and suggestions and requirements are as it relates to that. Now, I pulled some additional stuff. Um, so to me, uh, more and more grant agencies are requiring data management plans. Um, and depending on whether you're talking NIH, NSF, DOD, DOE, USDA, NASA, whoever, uh, they, they vary a little bit, but these are kind of the big picture things, I think. Um, so, uh, and there are models out there for data management plans when you get ready to submit grants and those kinds of things. But these are some of the things that were kind of top on my list. First of all, a data management plan should address who's responsible for what and preferably when as well. Um, and so those data, data management plans uh, follow that. 
Um, records management can be difficult. Having some kind of file management scheme and file naming, this is kind of one of the unwieldy things that I think uh, because the magnitude of growth as it relates to digital data, um, it, it's just, it's untenable. And so we have to find ways to manage data. I think what's going to happen if you've, if, um, what's it called? NFT, which is basically, a, a, it's a technology that's basically used to track digital assets in the world. Um, I don't know how else to describe it at this point. Um, it's kind of a, it's kind of an infant I still think it's an infant technology. It's limited to specific areas. If you know anything about uh, cryptology, crypto, coin, Do Dogecoin, Bitcoin, as far-fetched as those things sound, uh, there is credibility to them as far as it relates to digital assets and blockchain. When blockchain, all it does is keep track of an asset over time as it travels through the vir virtual world. I think at some point, research data is going to go that way where you're basically going to have uh, a blockchain uh, attachment to files that we work with and data that we work with so that you can tell where it's been and where it's going, who's who originally owned it. It's basically, you think know, blockchain is like massive metadata for data, right? Metadata is just data about the data, right? Um, uh, but when you talk about NFT, essentially what it's doing is it's keeping track of it and it's it's not erasable. You can never get rid of it. it so it's, it's basically like a digital asset that picks up stuff as it goes along in the virtual world. It goes from person to person, machine to machine, program to program, and it picks up pieces and it keeps track of where it's been um, all throughout its life cycle. So as long as the virtual asset exists, uh, you know, uh, it keeps track of where it's at. So I think as far-fetched as it might sound, if you've heard anything about Bitcoin is the one that everybody's heard about, but it's this idea that a digital asset can have a lifespan um, and it basically has data that it collects along the way. Anyway, that's more of a probably way you want to know about it. But coming from computer graphics, it's kind of like I geek out on that kind of stuff. So um, backup and security of data, ownership, um, ownership and retention, and then long-term planning. Uh, so these are kind of big issues in data management. And so a data management plan, this is basically what you're talking about is a data, data life cycle. Um, and so this is, and so when I talk about a blockchain idea for a for a data in the research space it basically be each stop in this wheel wherever and on whatever machine whatever program whatever person as that data moves around this circle multiple times because it, it basically does essentially as that data goes around that wheel it's picking up pieces it's picking up identifiable pieces of information as it goes along um, so, it, and, and it's kind of like another, another way to refer to it is if you've ever gone into a Microsoft Word document and you can look up who, who the original author of that document was, and you can look at who the last person was that edited it. Imagine a Word document that would keep track of every person that touched that document, every machine it was on every day that it was opened. That's essentially what I'm talking about by blockchain relative to data. Um, but data management plans, I mean, this is something that, what, probably emerged is a probably 10 years ago. Uh, I came from the NSF side. So I saw it when I saw NSF grants, when data, data plans became or data management plans became part of it. I didn't, I haven't lived the NIH side, even though I kind of deal with both sides now as research integrity officer, but this is what we're talking about. It's the data management plans, try to get your hands around this data life cycle. Um, most data management plans have these different kinds of things. Um, so these are just some suggestions if you're developing a data plan. And there's, there are templates out there that are probably more, more uh, complete than my cryptic description or limited description here, I should say. Um, but data management plans typically identify the type of data um, and other kinds of research outputs that might come from a grant. So almost every grant we do nowadays has a data management plan. And so these are pieces that would typically be there. How you're going to archive and store data formats that you're going to use, data file formats, I should say, repositories that you might park your data into any metadata pieces and there there are all kinds of lists of what are what are what are the categories of metadata that can be attached to various things whether you're going to share or not uh, legal and ethical restrictions on access and reuse and then long term data curation plans so all of these are if you were to look at it, and this is relatively consistent i think across all the big big federal sponsors as far as what they would expect in a in a data management plan um so let me stop for a second. I did see one. Uh, there was one comment in here. It was back to, to data books. I'm not sure if that if you're referring to that comment that's right back to back. Basically, in the old days, countersigned notebooks were legal, right? Yeah. So um, 
So that's a really good, so I'm going to stop and answer this question. Now I see the question. Sorry, just took can me a minute. Can you read the question too, if you don't mind? Yeah, I, I will. I, yeah. I will. Um, so it says, should we assume that all of our computers and network drives can be demanded via, via subpoena in legal disputes? I would say yes, if it is institutionally owned, it is, it is, it can be, and it's basically, I'll say as Rio, like at Purdue, um, I mean, you know, uh, research misconduct process is a quasi legal process. So I work directly with a lawyer, they're swearing in, swearing in when we do interviews. So it's, it's pretty much a legal process from my mind. It just doesn't happen in a court of law. But I will say when I sequester materials at Purdue, I can, as Rio, I can demand email, I can demand any network drive, if any personal computers, any personal drives on which any research, research data may have been touched, lived or whatever, I can sequester all of those. So based on my experience, I would say the, the likely answer to that is yes. Even like, like I'm here at home right now using a Purdue computer to do this demo or to do this uh, lecture. If, if, if there were an accusation legally or otherwise to me, they would have rights to anything on this machine, even though I do have some personal data on this machine. Um, and I know uh, as I've done sequestrations, um, there have been a couple of times where people have had stuff on personal drives and they're concerned about the personal da data, but I'll say that the institutional perspective is, I'm sorry, you have personal data on there. I'm not necessarily looking for that, but I have to, I have to sequester the entire thing. So my answer to you would probably be yeah, yes. I think it would be rare if the institution could not, or if, if those things could not be subpoenaed. Um, so hopefully I answered your question. I'm sorry, I didn't see it earlier when I was talking about data, bound data books because that was kind of the context that you used around it. Um, so legal requirements relative to data. So federal sponsors can come in and, and audit and examine records at any time. This is where this is why meticulous record keeping is critical, particularly I see it from the research misconduct side. So anytime a research misconduct allegation comes, if you're going, I mean, you know, to be exonerated, the, your best claim is honest error or that there wasn't fabrication, falsification or plagiarism. But you can't go back and create those records later. You would have had to create them all along the process. And so when I talk about records being critical for exoneration, that's what I mean. And so keeping and because federal sponsors can come in and look at it at any time, that's the other reason I would say that it's critical. Um, so any allegations of research misconduct, which is what I was just talking about. And, 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 and for those that are outside of academia, so inside academia, I'm not sure that patents are that big of a deal. I'm, I could be wrong, but in, academic institutions suck at trying to monetize patents and actually make something out of them, as opposed to my perception is, is that researchers in outside of academia, that's like the meat and potato of those companies. And so they know how to monetize patents. And so it's, to me, it's even more critical for, and I, and I'm, I, and I have to say when I'm, the judgment I'm making about academic institutions, I'm making about Purdue because I've only ever been at Purdue. I've been at Purdue 25 plus years. So I, I but I would suspect in talking with other colleagues across the United States, academic institutions are not very good at monetizing or commoditizing or commercializing patents such that they actually generate much revenue at all. That's just not their expertise. Um, and so that's why as a researcher, if an academic institution sells your patent to someone else, you're probably in a better place than them trying to monetize it themselves. But that's my biased opinion, I suppose. But nevertheless, when invention is made, research records are critical. And it's also critical for these other types of uh, compliance things like export, export controls, or if you're working with select agents, they put that kind of stuff. Um, data ownership. Uh, when I work with graduate students a lot, this is a big, a big issue because when a graduate student and it can be an issue for faculty as well, but when a graduate student moves one moves from one faculty member to another, they think they can just take their data with them and they can't. Similarly, a faculty member leaving an academic institution can't just take their data with them. Although I'll, I'll say Purdue is pretty generous in this regard as they typically will let the researcher take their, the, the data with them, typically will let them take the grants with them as well because they know that those grants are really kind of based in the individual, even though the agreement is between institution and sponsor. Right. And so what we have to realize is that the, the institutions truly own the data. And so whatever institution you're at, you're going to want to know what their policies and approaches relative to data and research grants that you get while you're there. Some may be liberal like Purdue and, or, you know, and allow you to take them with you, assuming you're leaving or departing on good, 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 good grounds. Other institutions, I've, uh, there have been researchers that have come to Purdue from other institutions where they had to sign non-disclosure agreements before they left their other academic institution, not, not even talking about business and industry. I'm just talking about 
another academic institution. That, that institution basically put a, you could essentially call it a gag order where they couldn't do anything for a period of three years in that particular line of research without a whole lot of legal trouble. So you really wanna know whatever institution you're in or going to, kind of what those rules are. Because to me, as a researcher, if you're going into a position, you don't need to just look at what's, we oftentimes talk about compensation package and we think about what you're gonna get paid a month, you know, the, the bennies as far as benefits is, whether that's healthcare and 401k and that kind of crap. But as a researcher, it goes beyond that. You wanna know what they're gonna do with your intellectual property and, and what kind of constraints they're gonna put on you while you're there and if you leave. To me, as a researcher, that's the critical thing to look at as, as your compensation packages, not just what you're making and, and that kind of thing. But I know I'm getting off topic, but um, nevertheless. So that's kind of the idea behind that. Just know what your institution, what they require, what they do. Um, all right, uh, data retention. So generally from federal sponsors, three years is kind of the mantra, I guess, as far as keeping data, even though we oftentimes um, uh, retain it for longer than that, obviously, because we're usually building research upon research, but the minimum will be three. If you're working with patents, then it's usually 20 years. I um, mean, there's other kinds of special requirements for data, and I'm not going to get into all the nuances. Um, you know, ultimately, if in doubt, I would talk to, you know, whoever, whoever your compliance officer is over data retention. Oftentimes, it may be defined by some legal, in, legal team within your group, um, because this kind of broaches on kind of the legal aspect of data retention between the institution and kind of their contractual partners. At Purdue, it basically be defined by sponsored program services, which that may be a similar term that's used in your institution as far as people that help manage awards and grants from major sponsors. Um, so data sharing and access, um, really the key for this is just knowing what the requirements are at Purdue. I mean, Purdue, Indiana has a, an open record statute Purdue is also under the Federal Freedom of Information Request Act, uh, the FOIA request, um, and, and it can be very difficult to kind of keep data private um, in certain situations. But really, the key is you knowing what your institution, wherever you're at, and knowing what those requirements are, uh, knowing also, and I'm kind of going bass backwards here, but knowing what your sponsor requirements are, uh, and then knowing when you can share and not share data. Um, and as PI, the PIs typically know this, but if, if any of you on here are graduate students, oftentimes graduate students are kind of operating in the dark. You oftentimes don't get to see these agreements and kind of stuff. So I would encourage graduate students, if at all possible, try to get, try to get copies of, you know, sponsor agreements and those kinds of things. So you can start getting a handle or get a feel for what's in them and kind of the auspices under which you have to work. A lot of times, you know, maybe staff in a research environment or, and, and include graduate students. So postdocs, grad students, people that are not the PI or co-PI on a grant oftentimes don't see all the legalese and legal documents that go along with this. If you're in that role of graduate student, postdoc or whatever, I'd be trying to get copies of that, not necessarily to, it's really just for the learning factor because there really is an art and science to both the grant writing process as well as managing, managing the whole thing. Um, and a lot of times researchers have different strengths and weaknesses as it relates to managing these projects. You know, one may be really strong with the relational aspect of a lab environment. Another may be really, really good with the data and contractual. See, I would, be, I would be the latter, not the former. I'm more of the uh, anally retentive OCD type A personality that likes lists and, and contractual language. So I'm good at this stuff. The relationship stuff can be a struggle for me. And so it's kind of like figuring out that of where your strengths lie to. So again, I, I sorry, for, I keep getting off track, I suppose. But well, that was my last slide relative to this. So let me um, let me just stop and see what kinds of questions exist. I think we're right at very, very close to uh, the hour, uh, which I was intending on trying to talk for about an hour and then just seeing what kind of see what kind of uh, questions might exist. So let me just kind of open the floor for questions um, at this time. So uh, one comment that I saw is that uh, Ruchi mentioned that um, NIH has recently introduced guidelines for data management, which is likely to improve having an auditable trail for data. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I was going to look that up real quick while, while you were actually answering the question that you answered or you said it real quick, the statement. Um, NS, I, I, so a lot of the organizations, NSF, NIH, all of the federals, um, you know, if you go back 10 years, there wasn't such a thing necessarily called a data management plan. So they implemented that and now they've been refining. It's good to hear that. And NIH, I've, I know less about because as far as a submitter, I've never submitted an NIH grant. I'm familiar with a, a lot of the different types and the requirements in that, but just not lived that life. So 
Um, but I would encourage anyone on here to take a look. And um, I forget the person that actually made that comment, but if you actually know where that link is, feel free to share it with everyone. If, if you have it handy, uh, that would be helpful, I think, for all those on the Zoom call here. Uh, there's another comment, yeah. Now I'm curious, as so it says there's a shift towards electronic lab notebooks. I'm curious uh, for those of you who are on here, if you could share, I mean, if you're willing to share in the chat, what, what are the names of the actual technologies that you're using? Because I know there are lots of different, uh, there are lots of different companies that are creating these lab notebooks or, and I would even, I would even go beyond and say it's even, it's really just lab, it's all lab resources, not even just notebooks. Um, and it would probably be good for you, if, particularly if we have people across the, across the nation here involved in this call, it'd be great to share what tools and technologies you're using. So uh, here's one called Lab Ar Archives or ELN. Lab Archives at IU, good. It looks like the lab archives folks win because they're the only ones chiming in. So we've got two for lab archives. I'm not sure what everybody else is using, but I would say if you're not currently using one of these, um, you may want to. Now, I would say uh, at Purdue, I mean, I, if Purdue had much more medical activity, much more NIH grant funding, I mean, and I'm not trying to discount and say that Purdue does it, but we don't have a med school. Um, and so if Purdue had a med school, there'd obviously be a lot more research. I know a lot of my colleagues, Rio colleagues, I have, I have, I've heard of lab archives, but many of the Rios are like, we really don't care what tool you're using as long as you use a tool <laughs> because it does, it does force some consistency. Um, but even the chat, but I would say even the challenges is as some institutions, you know, one, one unit might use this, another unit might use that. And so I'm not sure that it is totally functional as far as creating extreme consistency across the institution, but um, the comments, thoughts. <clears throat> I was wondering, I know uh, this workshop is primarily for wet lab or clinical researchers. And so um, for folks like myself then too, who are trained in kind of the wet lab realm, do you have advice on how to ensure reproducibility of computational work? Other than like include, I know you should include, you know, version numbers and, um, you know, you can put code in GitHub and stuff, but even some of our projects we've been working on in this class, um, you can see how there's, there's a discrepancy sometimes. There's not really standards for how people um, necessarily post their data or there haven't been so far. So sometimes they don't know what kits were used in generating the data. They don't even know if the data is normalized or raw. Sorry, I, I muted myself for a second. Um, off the top of my head, I don't, but what I do know is there are, there are a number of places that you can go online to find out suggestions for ways in which to create, create consistency within computational resources. And, and, and it goes beyond just labs. Um, and a lot of it, to me, a lot of it is car a carryover from what we would do in an IT unit. So like I, I for, for two and a half years, I did I, what I call an extended sabbatical in our central IT organization called ITAP, uh, Information Technology at Purdue. How creative is that, right? So anyway, it's called ITAP. And, um, you know, so using versioning software, a lot of it's just good IT uh, etiquette or, or, or habit, I would say. And so it's carryover from that. So really looking at any resources relative to IT standards relative to file naming. And I was looking this as I was preparing, because I added some stuff to the data management section uh, for this talk. Um, and I did come across, and I can't remember where I found it. Um, if anybody's interested, email me afterwards and I'll, I'll, go, I'll find it again and send it to you. But it was basically um, suggestions for file naming, suggestions for basically the use of IT resources to support the research enterprise. 
Um, and I thought it was in, interesting. I almost included it. Now I wish I would have, because um, it gave her some really good suggestions for computational. I almost would call them computational or IT habits to get into um, and to try to implement as like a consistent element across your lab or whatever. Um, anything that I would say, it'd be stuff that are kind of like obvious, like file coming up with some kind of file naming convention, no spaces in file names, making sure that extensions are turned on so you can see what the file type is. Um, if it's a, a, there are suggestions for trying to make sure that you, if you're, if possible, use open source data formats as opposed to proprietary formats. This is kind of like a laundry list of stuff that I would say that's kind of general, just general IT knowledge. But a lot of it applies. And so if anybody's interested afterwards, I can certainly provide that because I, I stumbled across that resource. I just didn't include it because it seemed like a next level of granularity for this for this presentation. If you if you could send it actually, or, um, yeah, that would they're interested and I'm interested and I can um, you know even post it on our Piazza page so that um, under optional reading so that um, any of the folks who are interested can can see that. Are there any other questions to comments? Well, thank you again for being here with us today and for speaking and a great presentation and um, really appreciate you taking the time. And I will, I, I didn't think to do it ahead of time, but I can send you the PowerPoint as well. If you want to distribute it, you're welcome. Oh, to. yeah. That would be great. Yeah, that would okay. be wonderful. Thank Can you. Do. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Hopefully this has been useful. And uh, if I can help in any way, I feel free to contact me individually. Uh, otherwise, have a great day. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. And we'll see you all at the uh, hands-on session, which is starting at three. So see you then.